Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we've got Kenny Caceres with Vegas Redevelopment Group. Yes. And he flew in from Vegas to share how he's flipped over 150 properties in the last three plus years. If this is your first time tuning in, I am Steve Trang, broker and owner of Stunning Homes Realty, founder of the Offer Fast Homes app, the only MLS for off-market wholesale properties. And I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires, so let's connect on Instagram. I do have a special announcement at the end of the show. There will be free shirts involved, so mm -hmm. definitely stay all the way through the show. Uh, and if you're excited for today's show, please give me a wave, give me a thumbs up. And as a friendly reminder, I do not charge a dime for this show. I don't make any money doing this. So this will cost for you to listen to the show. If you get value today, please tell a friend. You can share this episode right now, tag a friend below, or tell them your best takeaway later, later on, so that way we can all grow together. And don't forget, this is a live show, so please post your questions for Kenny to answer. You ready? I'm ready. All right, first question. What got you into real estate? Uh, got me into real estate. Uh, you want the long story or the short story? Long story. <laughs> long story, uh, I was 17 years old, dropped out of high school, and I was washing cars. And I stumbled across a mortgage business. One of my clients was a top performing mortgage in, uh, mortgage lender. And that has a lot to do with like the way I've carried out my business. Mm -hmm. um, came into the business when I was 17. I uh, was mentored by a top performing mortgage lender. and from 18 till I was 20, I worked as a dialer for a mortgage lender, building relationships with agents, <clears throat> excuse me, building relationships with agents as well as um, networking, trying calling, cold calling homeowners, refinances, you know, all that stuff. So the back end was, um, I wanted to get into more real estate industry because of materialistic things that I saw at that time. Yeah. Because my the guy the guy I was watching his car was killing the game. So for me, it was like, if, he's, if he could do it. And then on top of that, I found out he dropped out of high school. And I'm a high school dropout. I dropped yeah. out of high school. You know, so I was like, if he could do it, so can I. Was so. it you that posted that scene from Wall Street? Which one? Uh, Wolf of Wall Street, where it's like, if you show me a check right now, I will quit my yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I posted that on <laughs> Facebook a couple of times. <laughs> That's, that was you. Yeah, yeah. so long, like I said, bro, long story short, uh, dropped out of high school. This guy gave an opportunity to come work for him. I'm thinking, I'm, you know, seeing from the outside, and I'm like, it's a matter of no time I'm going to be in the money. So got into the mortgage business, and for two, two and a half years before I opened up my own company, uh, I've worked as a dialer and worked my way up from the bottom. That's up. awesome training. Yeah. No, it was one of the best. Honestly, I'm so thankful that I got I got to get all my rebuttals out with other somebody else's clients, not mine. So. Um, what year was that? This was uh, 2014, 2013 to 2000, the end of 2015, because okay. January 1st, 2016, I opened up my own company. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. that's a brutal call. I get lenders calling me all the time. Let's yeah. get lunch. Let's get coffee. Yeah. And it's just I'm it's the value add. I am just not very nice to those people. Yeah, no, it's not. Cause <laughs> a lot of them forget how to add value, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, very cool. So then let's talk about your very first wholesale deal. First, this very first wholesale deal. So um, I was first getting started, like quit my job in the mortgage side of the business, and it was all because I saw a wholesaler. Um, it actually, cold calling a realtor, encountered a wholesaler, and he's like, "Hey, why don't you come out for lunch with me one day?" And I was like, okay, went out to lunch and I see a twenty thousand dollar check being transferred from, you know, from where we're sitting across the table. And I'm like, what was that for? He's like, he sold an eighty thousand dollar house. I'm like, how does somebody make twenty thousand dollars from selling an eighty thousand dollar house? And he's like, It's pretty easy, man. You just gotta find the deal, find the investor who wants it, and you're done. So I was like, Okay. And then like two weeks after that lunch, I quit my job, bro. I was making oh. four thousand, five thousand dollars a month in the mortgage side of the business. Which I is quit, pretty good. Which was good. For where you were at. Yeah, honestly, bro, and it covered all my expenses. I was comfortable. Yeah. So I quit my job and I went all into wholesaling thinking that I was gonna be able to find a deal within a couple of days. I think 45 days from the day I quit my job, bank accounts wearing out, I only had two months of savings left. I mean, two months of savings since I quit. So my second month is running out and I stumbled across a deal and it actually led me right here to uh, Arizona, Surprise, oh, really? Arizona. Uh, I was an older gentleman, uh, 80 years old. He owned 25 houses, selling a manufacturing home. He had it on, on Zillow for 30 grand. And I found it, you know, I'm calling the homeowners on that time with Zillow. Deals are all over the place at mm -hmm. that time. So call the homeowner, get them down to 15000 for a manufactured mo mobile home and lock it down. And bro, I'm like, uh, I actually drove because I, I didn't know how to fill out a contract. I actually drove from Vegas to Surprise, Arizona. And it was like 4 o'clock in the morning. I show up here around 9, I knock on his door. He's like, what are you doing here? And he's, I'm like, I'm the guy that you talked to last night. I was like, I, I'm here to sign on the contract. I'm like, honestly, I need help filling out the contract. <laughs> and he's, he's looking at me, he's like, and then once I, in all reality, I had something I don't really talk to a lot of people. When I was sitting across from him, my tone was like, you know, uh, his name's George. I was like, you know what, George? I was like, I actually don't have the money to buy this property. Uh -huh. And he's like, well, how much money do you have? And I said, I got like 500 bucks. That's all I got left to my name. He's like, well, have you ever heard of owner finance? 
And I, I stayed quiet for a while. I was like, no, I don't know what owner finance is. Let me owner finance you. He's like, give me $300 down. I'll owner finance you the remaining $15,000 of this deal. And then I'm like, well, when do I pay you back? When do I do this? And he's like, just we'll do the paperwork. He actually designed the whole paperwork for me. Wow. Did the whole contracts. They got me to escrow, contacted an escrow company, wrote up the note. And then I was like, okay, I get the properties vacant. I go back, take pictures. I post it on a Spanish group on, on Facebook called La Pulga in Las Vegas. And at that time, there was like 40,000 Hispanics on there, bro. So I post this manufactured home of land for $45,000. And I get an offer within one hour of posting it for 45000 Wow. And I'm like, oh, so, you know, so I sit back <laughs> and I call him. I'm like, hey, I got an offer. I'm like, so how do I pay you back? And he's like, write up another purchase contract between you and you and the buyer. And I'm the bank, so they're going to call me up. So it was my first transaction was a full education, bro. It was like it was from finding my niche. That was what I stepped into to finding uh, my first private money guy to finding my first wholesale deal to even shopping out the deal. So my first transaction ever was, and I didn't know at that time, was a whole experience of what wholesaling was. So I, yeah. I, I'm honestly so blessed to have that have been my first transaction. You know, from fifteen to forty five thousand dollars, it was a, it was a heck of a blessing. And on top of that, it was like almost eighty percent of what I would have made in, in the mortgage industry. So well, it's crazy because a not a lot of people do seller finance no. so that's your first one yeah and then in b you took around this fifteen thousand property you bought yeah. and wholesale it for 45 you couldn't sell it for 30. yeah and i i i it was just something <laughs> magical i was like man i don't know i don't know what price to shoot it out for so i just yeah. threw a dumb number honestly it was a dumb number at the time i was like let me see what they said forty five thousand. but once i realized the high demand there was when i listed that property it was ridiculous yeah. man it was over 200 buyers interested in that property wow. i held the open house on a sunday and over 45 people showed up within the first hour. So it was like, to me, it was mind blowing being able to experience that from the very beginning and seeing that it was also a niche that I, I couldn't take that deal and shop it to a regular investor. They would have never bought it at that time. Yeah. Manufactured homes were, wasn't something that investors were buying. So then you're saying that you found this niche, so then you just kept going down this road. So now that I was already in that neighborhood, I was like, this is a rundown neighborhood in Vegas. I'm like, okay, well, I see I got 200 buyers. People talk about building a buyers list. I was watching YouTube channels at the time and it, people talk about building a buyer's list. So I was like, I already have a buyer's list without mm. want, needing, like I didn't build this one like on accident, built it on accident. So I was like, I already have a buyer's list. Let me go find something they're already in. So after that, it was more about, I, I was on Craigslist, I was on Zillow, I was on all these websites that for sub owners, you know, getting first started. And yeah, I struggled to get my second one as well, but once I found it, another manufacturing home, 17 grand, bought it. The lady was actually dying of uh, brain cancer, man. She oh. was, her time was, it was, uh, I guess the clock was against her at that time. Mm -hmm. So got the transaction, 17,000, and we were able to flip it again. I didn't have, like, I had the money, but I didn't use my capital to buy. Uh, my dad actually was the lender on that one after mm -hmm. that, bought it for 17, we flipped it, and we both, you know, we ended up selling it for like 45,000 as well. All of them were magical 45,000 numbers. So yeah. 200 people called, all I did was pick up the phone, start calling them again. And I didn't know at that time I was shopping out, you know, shopping out of property. So I was doing things without knowing that well, it was coming naturally. Well, I think the other thing too is that you kind of have this, you're going after and you're doing it, right? Yeah. There's so many people that have all these questions and I get questions all the time yeah. and I, I answer them all happily. They might not like my answers, but I answer yeah. all of them. Uh, but you have better questions when you're taking action. Yeah, absolutely. Right? The stuff that you don't find out on YouTube. Absolutely. You actually have to experience yeah, it. You have to get in the trenches. You yeah. have to get in the trenches. It's yeah. just, real estate is all about experience, man. You have to put yourself in situations, in awkward situations. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I find <laughs> myself in a little situation, even like right now, this is, this is only the fourth time we do something like this, but yeah. to grow, you have to be able to put yourself in situations that you wouldn't think or you don't know how to react in until you get in there. That's when you realize what you're capable of and how much further can you grow. 100%. So, yeah. so then what were some of your early struggles? Um, right off the bat for me was knowing that I come from a, I, you know, being in the mortgage business, it was more about being in suit and tie and, and selling a particular type of lifestyle. So it was more professional. And I noticed like when you're in these neighborhoods, and I was just a professional when I got into wholesaling, uh, I wouldn't just as comfortable as I am now. <laughs> but when I first got started, it was like, okay, I need to be in the student tie. And I was going out to these properties, but I noticed homeowners weren't open to me. So it was more about like changing, going from who I started at 17 and had to become um, to be, you know, to be, to be the, the, the company, yeah, be the professional, to getting eliminate, eliminating that, 
like being able to like you know be properly spoken but at the same time now dressing like a regular homeowner would mm -hmm. and it's like eliminating the youth factor so I, I i was like it took me a while to eliminate that because like i wanted to show up nice i wanted so finally one day i got home i was like i threw all all my dress shirts away i'm like i'm not gonna dress up like i, I started noticing because people the seller would tell you like well you show up in a fancy car you show up in, in nice clothes you're wearing the suit and tie you're just trying to you know uh keep living that way and look how we're living so it's like let me eliminate that objection so once I started dressing comfortably, so you have people tell you that, yeah, absolutely, all the time. So because I thought in the professional business you had to dress up, realtors dress up, mm -hmm. a lot of lenders do. So I was like, so why wouldn't an investor dress up at that time as a wholesaler? So I did the same thing, you know, trying to show I had money and I could do it and being professional. So that's interesting because yeah. I, when I was doing, when I was going to sell appointments a lot more, mm -hmm. I always showed up in the dress shirt. Yeah. I was always, you know, in the yeah. in the button up long sleeve. So. But I think for me, it was more about the areas that I was in, the particular yeah. areas, like the client, you know, mobile home, what do we call them, you know, yeah. trailer trash, a lot of times. So right. it was like the particular people I was I was prospecting, they had, they that had makes something, sense. yeah, they had something against it. But once I started noticing, I was dressing normal. And at the same time, one of my objections was as well, like being able to see, like sometimes I would call a, a, a landlord. He said, yeah, I'll sell the property, but you have to deal with the tenants. And the tenants, we don't want to show you the property. So one of the, my things was like, how do I get over that? So it wasn't just going to knock on the door. He let me in. So it was just like, hey, I'm here on behalf of the seller. And he takes, I mean, the owner takes some pictures. And once I'm there, I will pay attention as the water on, the light bills on. And I will, but sometimes I will honestly like take money with me and I'll pay for $80, $40 to that tenant pretty much to kind of let me in or help them pay for food. You know, like I, I would do that because it was just like, it gave me already the end. Yeah. And and then once I bought the property, I was able then to go back and and uh, pretty much set my own set my own expectations that I wanted with the, with the tenant. So that was one of my, my biggest objection overall that I had the biggest hurdle was, um, it was finding the money in the beginning, you know, yeah. being able to find how to buy these properties. I was, I had a good traction finding deals because like that was the thing about Vegas and I was actually just talking to one of your partner about this. You know, Vegas is the, at the, in the beginning was just more, if you had the properties, you know, uh, there were so many properties and only the guys who had the money had the gold at that time. Mm -hmm. Now in Vegas, it's so hot, and I, and I think Arizona and Phoenix is the same thing. Right now, it's not a lot of deals. There's a lot of money, though. So mm -hmm. the guys who hold the properties hold the gold now. So I noticed that, and, and that was my biggest thing. I couldn't find the money at that time. Yeah. And I could find a lot of deals. You could just pick up the phone and homeowners were willing to sell because they didn't know how much longer was the market going to trend up. So right. they, someone would, you know, if they had a 10% or 20% uh, equity share, they wanted to sell immediately. So... Vegas is kind of crazy. I mean, obviously, Lathan was out here not too long ago, yeah. and Ryan's coming out of here soon. Yeah. How is your business different than your peers in Vegas? Um, I think I'm. I'm not gonna say I'm the only one, but I think I'm one of the few that has. So what I've done is I've created because I have a mortgage background, and in mortgage to be a successful mortgage lender, the more realtors you have referring you business, the more established you become in the industry, mm -hmm. and longer play you have. So the one of the biggest encounters i had growing was i couldn't stay in front of enough homeowners mm -hmm. to stay afloat so i was like let me go back and take it to where i originally started my business career which is realtors so i pulled all the realtor database and what we did was uh, i started building a network and this is the first time i share this in full mm -hmm. detail um i build a de I build a network of realtors and what i started doing i started establishing myself as an investor for them and as well as i I, we prospect homeowners now in our company, yeah. but the only reason we prospect homeowners is to give our realtors uh, business, give them listings. That way when the realtors, because Vegas is a, a realtor dominated business, 18,000 agents in Vegas. So it's like, why would I go and compete against 18,000 people mm -hmm. when I could just network with them, just create a small network, get 20, 30 good relationships for myself, and then my team can replicate exactly what I'm doing. But at least I know for a fact, I got 20 agents out there that are prospecting. They're gonna bring me a deal. If each one brings me one deal per year, I'm already at 20 to 30 transactions just myself a year uh -huh. and then so my biggest my my niche is the real estate side of the business working with realtors establishing myself with realtors and um like a mortgage lender would literally the same style that's of so funny lender that would. you took your mortgage experience yeah and leverage right back to, to yeah. market to realtors again it was hard for me man prospecting <laughs> homeowners is one of the hard i to, even to this day like i know i guess i know how to speak like the real estate language the terminology mm -hmm. a realtor wants to hear and, but it's so hard for me to like vibe with the seller, you know, and yeah. try to get him. That's the reason like some of my guys, like uh, I have one of my guys, Chris, he's he's on my team. He's excellent with sellers, but I'm not like that. Even Lewis, you know, he's on my team as well. My right hand man, he's uh, great with sellers, but but they're not that good with realtors. And, you know, I can make one, I can make five calls and, and I'll get one deal out of every five calls that I'm making, you know, but they do the same thing with them. Like they'll make more uh, less calls with homeowners and get more transactions than I ever would. Yeah. So, but my biggest thing is just the realtor side of the business. I think a lot of investors on our side of the business, 
they think that it's all about prospecting realtors, the right. ones that who are doing it. They think it's about just dialing out the list. But at the end of the day, it's about creating those relationships. You right. don't need that many. You only need 10. And if 10 dudes bring you 10, one transaction per month, you had 120 transactions a year. Yeah, no, so. that's that's huge. Uh, so I got, I got some questions here. Um, so Rycat asks, how are you dominating in mobile homes? So mobile home side, uh, I get asked this question so much all over Instagram. I honestly get like about 50 of these answered questions a, a month. And yeah. the biggest thing is it's not the, the mobile home. It was the niche that I found. It's the fact that I found a niche of Hispanic buyers who have literally the magical numbers, 40 to 50 grand, mm -hmm. and they're literally sometimes in their mattress. And and I found the product that they want for that because they can't find nothing. The average sales price right now in Vegas is like 285. Mm -hmm. So they can't afford something. And then private lenders won't only finance for so long. So it's like, if you can find that magical product that feeds to that, like for example, mine's a Hispanic niche. I just feed them what they want, you know? And, right. and I could easily try to sell it for 70, on the MLS, I might sell it, but it might take three to four months. Mm -hmm. Or I could have a, a high turnover, get something for 20, sell it to them for 50 grand within 24 hours. Right. And literally, like we said, keep it pushing. So, so you're just satisfying demand. Satisfying demand. You know, I yeah. didn't, it wasn't something I chose or studied. It was actually just seeing that it was a particular property. If I have this property at this price, homeowners are willing to pay for it. It's particularly the Hispanic bars are willing to pay for this, this type of product. So it was just supply and demand. Uh, so going back to your, your point about, you know, um, networking with realtors yeah. so if you were to, to replicate this in another market let's just say hypothetically phoenix yeah. how would you replicate that here what would you do <laughs> funny thing we were actually just talking about that over lunch mm -hmm. um i'm noticing that phoenix is more of a guru and as well as wholesaler dominated side of like yes, investor dominated let's call it it's very investor dominated so, but it's just like, you guys still have, I believe, 30,000 licensed agents in the state of Phoenix. 40,000. I mean, state of Nevada, uh, 40,000. 40,000. 40,000 40, licensed. It's stupid. So at the end of the day, it's just like, <laughs> what are those guys? I, the, my my mathematical situation goes right back to like, are those agents full-time? Are those agents, how many transactions are they mm -hmm. doing? Because what a, what a professional list, what a, let's say, what a high-performing listing agent does, mm -hmm. and he gets in front of pro properties continuously, one of those, not all those are retail and not all those could get listed at top dollar. Mm -hmm. A lot of those sometimes need work. So it's just like, you want to build a relationship with those guys that are getting in front of a lot of listings mm -hmm. and they're going to come across properties that need work or a seller has a high package and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, the same investors that are in the MLS shopping, you could be that guy before it hits the MLS. So it's just about kind of creating the interception. You want to intercept the deals before they hit the MLS, you know. It's a great point. And it's a good thing I have a really good friendship with a lot of the top realtors in town. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> Uh, so I'll definitely leverage that. Uh, so how much wholesaling are you doing right now? Uh, I guess the new terminology that I don't know if it's new, but I, it's new to me, hoteling. Mm -hmm. I guess I hotel, I acquire properties. I don't wholesale anything. Everything that we we sell, we own. And it was on top of that, again, it was to perform to our relationships. Our relationships, I couldn't tell them, hey, I'm an investor, I could close. And then the only thing I do is like send a contract that doesn't give me the leverage to, you know, and then I'm shopping it out. So I didn't want to create that. So what we started doing was well, we got transactional funding. We have private funding that allows us to be able to acquire a property, um, pay our investors a small percentage or sometimes even a large, depending how much, how many properties we bought. And then we could turn around and sell them. So for me, it's all about having the leverage of being able to get these deals and closing on them. So we, we don't wholesale anything. Everything has like. I, I say what I do, so I so have you're the to buyer. Buy. I have to be the buyer. Okay, you know, and and, and then yeah, I'll, I'll wholesale them more if the deal's really good. Sometimes realtors bring me really a situation where the homeowner needs to liquidate and get out of it immediately. So we'll come buy the property, and then I'll I'll straight up ask them, what do you think the property's worth if I just trash it out and we list the property again? Like, well, you bought it for one fifty, maybe we could sell it for two hundred thousand. That most like. I give it right back to them. They brought it to me, buy it, close it, list it again with them. So I'm also helping them increase their their um, their, volume, sales. Their, sol their sales. So, so. Uh, what commission do you pay these guys? Mm. That's a struggle <laughs> for a lot of investors. Um, and honest, realtors. It's a struggle on both sides. Honestly, it's not. Uh, for me, it's it's more about like a realtor will bring you a deal on a silver platter as long as he knows he's being taken care of. Right. A lot of investors are always looking out for their own pockets. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm in the transaction side of the business, you could say. I'm literally just transaction coordinating the front end and the, front end and the back end of the deal. I already have the buyers that are going to buy. I already have the, the sellers that, you know, the guys bringing me the product. So at the end of the day, it's just as long as my realtors are taken care of. So the benefit of a realtor doing business with me is 
they'll bring me the deal. And let's say in Vegas is 1% if they have the listing. Well, in exchange, instead of them putting on the market and getting the uh, giving away the 3%, mm -hmm. now because I am the buyer, they can have the listing, they bring me the property, now they're taking 4%. The 1%, mm -hmm. if, as long as the seller lets them, you know, dual agency. So now we're making the, they're making the 4%. If the deal has enough spread, I'll pay them another 2% directly to a broker. So 4% on the, on the, when you buy it? Just when I buy it. And then in exchange, once I fix it, and I get and we rehab it, or if we listen to the market, they'll make again another five percent, another one percent. So they're making it, and if, if they bring another buyer, they can make anywhere from five to eight percent on, on the right. transaction. They were only originally going to make one percent on, right? So they're making five to eight percent. So they're happy, okay. and sometimes it's a bonus depending if they can sell the property in less than 10 days. I'll, I'll kick them back two thousand dollars. Like for me, I'm not attached to money, man. So, well, that's like that's really wise, though, right? Like you're taking care of the realtors because exactly. I know a lot of investors will not pay the realtor more than one percent. Exactly. Like, why am I bringing it to you? Cause, yeah, because you're counting their money. Like, <laughs> why would I bring it to you when I can bring it to this other guy? Exactly. Uh, so, you say transactional funding, or what was the other? Private money. Private money. Yeah. Okay. So, what have you done to find private money? Um, private money has actually been just for me. I've never. I guess everything I've I've done in my business has been more from the growth. I, I don't rush anything. I'm never really looking. So when I was wholesaling, uh, and this is something I shared uh, I shared with a few people before. When I was wholesaling, I would if, let's say I could have made twenty grand. I would reduce my wholesale assignment by ten thousand dollars, and all I wanted was to be put on title. I was like, as mm -hmm. long as you guys put me on title and it shows I'm also an owner, I'll still make half just to be able to build the credibility. Cause I'm like, if I'm gonna be in this business, am I gonna be in this short term? Am I gonna be in the long term? Mm -hmm. And in short term, it would have just been making 20 grand, $30,000 checks. But as long as my name is going on title and I'm it's being recorded, I create that track it. record. Yeah, I create that track record and it's documented. So now it gives me leverage as well. So when I meet somebody who has capital, I can be like, look, this is what I've done. This Man, is the numbers. And I don't, smart. and when I was talking to your partner about this, like I don't show them like the lower numbers i show them, i mean i don't show them the high checks i'm like look at what we're making on the higher checks i mean on the lower checks mm -hmm. so as i look what we got on this property we made seven to ten thousand dollars are you okay with making 30 percent of that or you know 20 percent if they are then i'll show them the properties that i have twenty thousand dollars i'm like these are these on top of this is what we get but this is like uh coming to america i don't know if you watch that movie right? I haven't watched pretends that. to be yeah. poor yeah right to yeah. attract the girls anyway <laughs> I, i'm old i haven't um, checked that one out yet. <laughs> but i like that you're taking care taking care of the realtor yeah it's all about taking care of people man this business is like if you're gonna if you want to establish yourself yeah. people have to know you're gonna take care of them even with social media like i don't know if you've seen it like we promote the two to five thousand dollars in referral fees like yeah. what i'm doing is pretty much recreating wholesalers in a sense like the same people were sending thousands of dollars in marketing spending thousands of dollars in marketing they're on social media consuming us you know they're yeah. like you or me they're on social media consuming so we've we've had some guys that literally don't have a, a lick of experience in real estate and they, like they find us two deals and they got them paid and they made wholesaler checks just by bringing us deals by recommending us their mom their dad their uncles you know it's people that they know it's like the same people that another wholesaler another realtor is going to call mm -hmm. in and instead of me going in competition it's just like i could give their son or their daughter or whoever's following me a, a, a check you know and even those people that are getting evicted we offer them referral fees like don't get evicted we'll extend your 30-day eviction as well like if your landlord's really that tired of you and he doesn't have the money to evict you or whatever situation is I'll buy the property. If I buy it, I'll put three to five thousand dollars in your bank, and as well, I'll give you another thirty days. So you have sixty days to move out in this yeah. situation. So it's about finding the the distress situations at all time. I like what you said, uh, or I think I heard you say was the um, you're giving a percentage of the profit to the private investor. Yeah. So you're, it's not it's not interest. It's not points. Yeah. It's no. straight up equity. Equity. Yeah, absolutely. And how much equity do you give them? It depends. Uh, so I got three different private guys. Some of them, one of them, because I could literally. I can move that money however way I want mm -hmm. and he won't ever question it. So in that relationship is a 70, 30, he takes 30%, I take 70%, but I can move his money. Like I said, whatever way I want that guy never sees none of our, none of our, our rehabs or properties that we buy. He just cuts checks and that's it. I, I literally can, I, I have an example that I share with people and it's just like, I could be dead broke right now, but I could still buy a million dollar house just because of the leverage and the relationships we have. Right. So, he doesn't he he's on a 70 30 split then i got two other partners uh one of them is 50 50 but we actually rehab properties with him like he actually buys the properties he only wants to rehab so i acquire the properties in the back and he expends everything and all i gotta do is manage the pro properties bring the properties to the table and he puts up 50 we go 50 50 and then i got an 80 20 uh hard money lender same thing her she's a little she, we don't have that much capital to work with with her but it's eight hundred thousand dollar line of credit that we're working with but same thing 80 20 she takes 20 percent. i take 80 so yeah. and like i said again for me pitching my private guys was more like 
are you okay with making money on these small deals? Look at the small deals we're bringing in. Sometimes this is what we're cashing out, and this is what you're gonna make. If you're okay with that, pretty much they end up becoming transactional funding because when I have a property locked down, nine times out of ten I already have a buyer. So mm -hmm. out of like out of the 150, 157 properties we flipped, I've only rehabbed like ten. Oh wow! Yeah, so I've only rehabbed like ten. All the other ones have been wholesales. We're gonna buy them or hotel. I'm not sure the terminology. Hotel, yeah, yeah. Hotel. So. We just buy, I call them buy and flip. We still buy and flip the properties. You know, we trash them out. And just the trash outs alone that we're doing is netting us an extra ten to $15,000, so. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, so then Brian Samuels wants to know, how much, uh, how has your marketing strategy changed from when you started to where you are today? So from, from day one, um, like I said, it was, there was so many opportunities in Vegas because people didn't know how long the market was gonna last. It was trending and we had rumors, you know, market's gonna collapse 2016, mm -hmm. 2017, all these rumors. Still so, going on. Those it's rumors. still going on. Um, so a lot of those rumors were high effect at that time. So sellers, if they were just barely breaking even or those situations, um, we were able to find, sellers were answering the phone continuously. There wasn't a lot of competition. So I was able to easily get in front of sellers. Mm -hmm. My first year I did 25 transactions and it was all sellers. but actually 20 and then five of them were from, from realtors. And, but what I noticed my second year was I started my first quarter so slow that I wasn't getting any transaction. I'm like, what do I have to do? Like I have to switch it back up and it has to go back to what I'm known for. And I was known in the mortgage industry. Like I was, like I said, 18 years old when I first started. So getting started, people saw me growing up and they knew I was in the mortgage side. So I was like, I have to find a way that benefits me and adds value to all these people that know me as well. And I wanted to establish myself as like being a wholesaler tucked away and from my bedroom and just making calls wasn't getting me exposure in Vegas. And as well, I wasn't setting up camp because I wasn't establishing my empire in Vegas. So I was like, well, how am I gonna switch that up? And the only way to switch it up is by the guys that are constantly moving around. You, you mm -hmm. see realtors hosting so many meetings and galas and doing this. So it's just like, I have to get in bed with the guys that are making moves. And as long as they know who I am, I could remain a fixture of Vegas for a while. So it was more from calling homeowners and strategizing and as well we were leveraging every relationship like even as well like i would uh, when i didn't have my private funding and i was still technically wholesaling uh i would bring the deals to my investors and the, and the realtors would be like well how are you gonna get paid like don't worry about it you know i'll, I'll, I'll work it out with my investors and sometimes because I, I was on title i would get paid on the back end you know mm -hmm. i'll wait to the back end and even if i had to scrape, scrape two pennies together i will wait just to establish my dominance and my you could say the play in the vegas market i like it i mean it's very different very different yeah. than what i'm hearing uh, what does your organization look like today? So uh, we're a seven-man team. We have four dialers. Um, they, they focus on prospecting, home, uh, like I said, realtors and, and homeowners as well. And then we have uh, my acquisition. We call him my manager, office manager. He's pretty much transaction coordinating, sales manager. He's everything on the back end. That's Lewis. He runs everything. And then myself as an investor in the company mm -hmm. pretty much makes last decisions. But uh, four man team dialing, you know, the four guys on the phone, uh, building relationships with the agents, literally trying to replicate exactly what I'm teaching them to do. Like mini mortgage lenders, you could say. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> then we have the, the office manager, which is like the underwriting side of the business. He communicates with escrow and all that. And honestly, our company has become, has become, I guess in a way like automated because it's just like we already, the deals already come to us on a silver platter. All we're yeah. doing is like, yes, no, yes, no. And then nothing like even when we go out to walk properties and stuff like that we're never negotiating like i i haven't negotiated a property in a while like, you know uh brian manley he's a big player in our market well yeah. he's in our market he's a big player in east coast i yeah. want to say north carolina and yeah. he said something to me the other day it was really wise i haven't told him that he that i really liked it uh but it was um uh pros sort amateurs mm. convince mm. i was like damn that's really wise i like them yeah or amateurs so, uh, convince professional sort so mm. like you're yes or no right yeah, it's like you're a server like absolutely. you want to cook no okay and then you just move on in the yes or no business yeah, it's yeah yes that's, or no. that's what i talk to my guys about daily i'm like i'm in the yes or no business so like i would not spend six months chasing a no mm -hmm. i i hear so many people teaching like oh if you get that no keep calling keep calling to finally get a yes it's just like well why don't you just focus on the yeses it's like right. well, focus on what's in front of you so like i've been in the follow-up business bro i was in the mortgage side of the business you have to follow up a lead. Like when I was in mortgage side of business, there was one, th like two quarters that we followed up on 60 leads. Out of those 60 leads, we converted one. And it was like, is it actually that worth it? Like we were getting more in front of opportunities, more deals on the, when, as long as we keep moving forward. Like, yeah, sometimes you can circle back around and get somebody to get a deal. But mm -hmm. the reality is it's just like, you get more in front of more opportunities stop following up by getting in front of more opportunities. That's just my, the way I see it. It's just like- It's the way you your business. Yeah, I like it. I just got to focus on, on what's in front of me. Can I get a yes today? Can I get it? Am I going to get yeses or no? As long as if I'm hearing no's, that means I'm taking actions. And if I'm getting a yes, like 
it, it was part of the work, you know, the 125 and two rule. So. I mean, that's the, that's our traditional business, right? Yeah. There's a lot of follow up, yeah. lots of follow up, but our wholesale side, it's yes or no. Yeah. That's it, it's over. That's, that's what I want to hear, yes or no. Or yeah. can we do an order carry on this deal? <laughs> that's it. Uh, Kevin Saunders wants to know, what's your phone script when you're talking to a realtor? Uh, when I'm talking to a realtor, it's an initial I, phone call. I, w I don't really have scripted. Uh, one of the things I, I do not have any scripts is more of an introduction, which the base goes, I am a buyer and you're a realtor. Are you working with anybody in the market right now that's, um, you know, are you servicing as an, as a potential client? Do you have any investors that you service? And, and so what are you doing and how's the how are you guys working? Or if they say no, they're not working with anybody, do you get in front of potential listings that might need, you know, fixer upper or that they need work? And it's, a, it's pretty much yes or no. Like, yeah, you know, I'm working with some properties. So what are you doing in those situations? Well, I put them on the MLS. And how are they moving once you're on the MLS? Well, I struggle to get a deal because some of these guys are lowballing me. Well, why don't we do this? Like, before you put on the MLS, let me take a look at it. If I can see it happen, then, you know, if I can make something happen, and I'll give you yes or no within, for my pitches within 20, 30 minutes, I can let you know immediately. And I let people, as long as realtors as well, that are that are active in the market, I let them know like, hey, before you put a property on the market or show it to your investors, why don't you give me a five minute, 10 minute shot? Mm -hmm. You know, give me, give me a five, 10 minute shot. I'll let you know immediately, yes or no. Yeah. And then they're like, okay. And though someone will test me like, here goes your 10 minutes countdown starts. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And I'll let them know like, yes or no. And then, yeah. And uh, sometimes I'll, I won't really explain my no, and they ask to know, like, why didn't you say, why did you say no? Oh, because of this and this reason. And sometimes they'll they'll go back and be like, you know what, let's do it because your reasons didn't make sense. Or, you know, the yes was so so direct and so powerful that they'll lock up the deal immediately right there with the seller. So for me, it's more about letting them know I'm a buyer in the market, I'm active, I have the proof of funds, I could close when I say, and pretty much speaking the language, no inspections, no contingencies, I'm not gonna have you running around, you know, uh, uh, doing a bunch of paperwork and then at the end of the day bail out on you right. and as well one of my, one of the key things when you're first proving yourself that I think any investor could do is non-refundable EMDs if you feel stern you're gonna buy that deal like we offer fifteen thousand ten thousand dollars non-refundable EMDs and yeah. sometimes like highest isn't always best mm -hmm. like I'll come in sometimes ten thousand dollars lower than any other investor and be like okay I can, an example hundred hundred thousand dollar house I'll come in at one uh, ninety thousand and offer a fifteen thousand dollar non-refundable EMD well, as yeah. long as prelims clear and because I know I'm going to shut it down and I'm comfortable. So uh, back when I was in a lot of REO uh, back in the day, there were some hedge funds. Yeah. And they would come in and they'd offer you 185000 for the house mm. with a non refundable earnest of 185000 Oh, shit. So, like, yeah. they're closing. Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. They're depositing that mo earnest exactly. money. So there is no question whatsoever. I think, I think the real estate is all about, like, if you really have the money, mm -hmm. you have to act like you have the money. You have to carry yourself as that. You, know, 100%, you can't 100%. you can't say you have the money and then struggle to come up with a two thousand dollar EMD or a thousand dollar or delay or drag your feet. Like you have to say, you know, what is it? You have to say and do what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. Um, what was I gonna ask? Shoot. Uh, so you got your um, everyone's locally in your office. Everybody. Yeah. No virtual assistants. None of that. Okay. Uh, if you know, we talked about realtors. That's your marketing. That's your best marketing. Is there a specific specialty you're going after? Um, no, nah, pretty much Vegas is Vegas is is so cookie cutter. All the properties are pretty much the same. It's just I just want to know the cross streets, and yeah. that's pretty much it. So anywhere in Vegas, I'll buy as long as the numbers make sense. And right now, Vegas is so hot. Like you got properties that sell within hours or minutes of being on the MLS, you get multiple offers. So um, now my my niche is pretty open. Like you know my my uh, properties, what I look for is pretty open. I don't okay. yeah. So I remember what I was going to ask you now. So what do you offer? Like I'm a realtor, right? I yeah. got this property. I say, hey, Kenny, I got this house. Yeah. You and I know it's worth two hundred thousand fixed up. Correct. Needs like thirty thousand repairs. Correct. What are you paying? Well, see, I don't, I don't ever really, I never really get those scenarios because nine times out of ten, the realtor already came to a conclusion with the, with the homeowner what the property is going to be listed for. Okay. So with the, I always tell the realtor, bring me the property that you have a listing contract for. Okay. So pretty much if I say no, you can still move forward and list the property. Gotcha. So they bring me a property that's listed. So you just get first shot. Yeah, I get first shot in every, in every one of them. And sometimes okay. I, uh, a lot of times realtors don't know how to pitch the owner with carries. Mm -hmm. So I, I've had so many situations and they're like, my seller needs to net 10 grand or, you know, like, like the last one I did was like, my seller needs to net $10,000. 
And even if I waive my commission and only get 500 bucks, he still has to pay 3%. He's walking away with seven. I, he really needs a 10,000. Okay, why don't you let me have a conversation with him? I offer the seller 10,000 as long as a conventional loan. I could give him the $10,000, take it subject to the existing mortgage, pay your full commission, mm -hmm. and I'm still getting a better entry than when you would have gave me because we're limiting that 3% from the right. very, that you were going to pay the other buyer's agent. Right. In exchange, now I got a deal. I'm out of pocket 13, 14,000. And then, you know, we're, we're the one I had was 190. The seller needed net 10, so put me all in like 205. We resold it for 265 after putting like 15, 20,000 into it, I believe yeah. it was. But no need for hard money or giving up equity on that point. So, but there has to be a number that your formula, like, so forget the realtor equation. What do yeah. you buy at? Um, you know, I've been blessed to get properties at 65 cents on a dollar, man. Really? 55, 65 cents on a dollar. And another thing too is, is not some, it's not that I'm negotiating to that term. I feel like a lot of people are, are not educated on the rehab side. Mm -hmm. So they overestimate the rehab. Like mm -hmm. they're like, oh, this needs 50,000. And I'm looking at like, I could get it done for 15 grand. Like I have an in-house construction team. It might not look like state of the art or, you know, these, these uh, TV commercials. It's but not HGTV. Not HGTV, there you go. I wasn't sure if I could say their name, but yeah. you know, uh, it's not HGTV quality, but it gets it done and it matches every other product that's on the market that will sell. So for me, like a lot of realtors think they need to do an HGTV product, mm -hmm. when in reality just needs carpet, paint, lipstick job, and just keep it pushing, you know, list it back on the market. So it's also knowing what do you need to do. And, and as well, sometimes you don't have to flip a property for top dollar. You can you could throw up a, you know, a, a lipstick rehab, offer for $10,000 less and even offer a credit and you're still making a good amount of money. Right. You know, so that's kind of what I just, I look at every deal on, as a mortgage lender. What would a mortgage lender want his 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 buyers to to do? Like ask for a credit, potentially have the listing agent give give a buyer's credit, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I just analyze every relist or every potential deal that I will sell to an investor. Can he offer these? And if mm -hmm. he can, can he still make money? And if he does, we got a deal. Gotcha. And, you know, so. uh, are you pulling data? Uh, so I'm using a system right now uh, that I'm still I'm still testing. Um, so I, I really don't want to drop the name and, and give bad bad uh, reviews on there. But uh, we pull data from time to time. Uh, but like I said, the majority of the business, the reason we pull homeowners is is more to give back to our realtors. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily for us. Like I think out of every 40 transactions, of, well, actually out of every 10 transactions, sorry, we maybe get one homeowner. Nine are realtors, one is homeowner, mm -hmm. and those homeowners are like, pulling teeth, man. Like they their headaches, the titles, all that stuff. Like I said, realtors simplify it for me. So all they right. bring it directly to the table on a silver platter. Excuse me. And then um, like homeowners, we have to deal with this, we have to deal with that. So um, not really too much on the homeowner side. We get in front of a lot of homeowner leads, but I give them back to my relationships. Like, hey, I have a potential listing here, take this, you know, and I add value. You know, I request value and I give you value in return. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, so you already answered the, this question. So, um, so then you're not really, if you're not really putting a lot of lists, then you're not really skip tracing a lot either. Uh, so then your your guys are pr predominantly cold calling realtors more than yeah. So like I said, uh, eighteen thousand agents in Vegas. It's yeah. a big data, and it it's is big data. And like I said, it's not about just calling down the list. It's mm -hmm. about taking genuine time to build a relationship. It's slow, but like I said, if if I'm gonna be in this long term, I'm gonna take it one step at a time. So the guys get paid if they're saying the right things. They can get in front of an opportunity immediately that same day. So they can get in front of the opportunity. And then on top of that. Um, you know, like for me, social media plays such a massive reward. Like when I say I'm paying two to five thousand dollars, I'm getting four to five leads a week off of Instagram. Is so that is that why I'm seeing cash on your Instagram feed? Yeah, yep, all the time. So, <laughs> so. Um, okay, so the disposition is strictly through MLS. Disposition is through MLS, or like I said, if it's if it's a deal. Sometimes when we get these homeowner deals, I will shop them out to other investors, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I hold I hold time to other investors and. Um, yeah, I normally I'm in charge of that normally. So or okay. mobile homes, if it's mobile homes, one of one of my guys on my team, he'll go out there. But like I said, at that time, we already pretty much know what we're gonna get is just open the door and let 40, 50 buyers walk through <laughs> the property, and then we literally have a contract, and whoever wants to grab and write and sign their name on it, that's it. So yeah, yeah so you just do uh, first good offer. It's not even like sorry, first full price. It's not it's not a bidding war, it's not an auction. Very rarely we stepped into a bidding war. Um like I said, the magical number is at forty to fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. So some guys they'll come in like, you know what, I only have forty five thousand and sometimes like like well or I only have thirty grand. And depending on what price that I get it for, I can sometimes do an owner with carry. I like, mm -hmm. you know what, give me thirty five, at least I get my initial cash out and then I owner finance remaining balance. Or sometimes it's only been one or two times we've had a complete bidding war, but it was I it was actually a property I regret selling. It was it was 
it was a home run. It was a home run. You know, it was, it was such a beautiful property that, you know, we sold it for 50. The guy ended up finally saying, I'll give you 65,000. And it was an actual bidding war there. And they yeah. were arguing with each other, buyers. But, and you know, like I said, it's, it's uh, it was Black Friday there. Yeah, it really was. Every, every time we get a manufacturing home, man, uh, it's crazy the amount of people we get out there. Uh, so what are you guys spending every month on marketing? Zero. <laughs> zero. Man, that's zero. huge. Just unless you consider lunches and, and Starbucks drinks. I mean, those are technically marketing expenses, yeah. but um, let's Juan, Juan Lumberos wants to know, how vertically integrated are you? Uh, do you own any companies? Where are all the companies he has that you own? So you have uh, any other companies or is it So Vegas Re Development Group is the main umbrella and I have other entities that are under Vegas Development that I don't, you know, I don't disclose those, but um, to protect my partners on those. And then I have Trash Out Pros, mm -hmm. which is a trash out company. I'm partnering up with one of my dollars on that. Um, we've, we've built Trash Out Pros. It's actually an acquisition company. And, and I recommend anybody who's out there listening, like it's one heck of a company, you know, it's getting two, three deals a month. Getting We're getting in front of two to three deals a month just by hopping in, uh, in front of like, pretty much a lot of homeowners will contact us to trash out their properties. And right there and then our general manager can ask like, what are you gonna do with this property? The guy going out to give the bid in exchange, uh, if they don't, if they can't afford the, the trash out bid, then in return what we're doing is like, so what are you gonna do? Well, I was planning on selling it, but so right there and then it's a lead heading back to the, pretty much the, our real estate company. Yeah. One of our other guys on the acquisition team contacts them and we're right in front of there. So it's it's just another way of getting in front of them. And then when we do do the trash outs, it's still making 2,500 bucks and it's already automated. Like we got a guy on salary and we got a guy on the truck with a two man team out there. We got a, guy, a general manager who's going out giving bids. So I have nothing to do with, uh, um, I'll go out once in a while just to look at what, how the company's operating. But it's, I've literally created Trash Out Pros as an acquisition company. So I need to go start a trashing company. Man, yeah, for, it's for me, it saves me money on, on all the properties we, we hotel because they're full of trash. So it saves us a crap ton of money instead of paying a company 10,000, 20,000 a month. I keep that all in house. Even if mm. I don't do any jobs that month, I'm technically getting like 10 trash outs done for like three grand, you know? So yeah. with salaries and expenses. What other companies do I need to start to, to get? Social media, <laughs> man. I recommend everybody right now, like it's not about, um, I think right now, like the era that we're in, everybody mm -hmm. should be branding themselves yeah. and making themselves a fixture, not even nationwide, making themselves a fixture in their local city. Mm -hmm. And like, I see so many people use social media for the wrong reasons. They use social media to brag, they use social media to stunt. But in reality was if you can offer anybody, the mom and pops, your friends from high school, an opportunity to get in with you, you can make a lot of money and they can yeah. make money because now you start establishing yourself as a fixture in your community. And I feel a lot of people lag that and they, they don't, comprehend that social media literally man like <clears throat> i'm i'm pretty sure you probably are more on social media than your tv you know oh like, yeah 100%. I, i'm on social media daily so it's just like i consume five and a half hours of being on on instagram <laughs> five and a half hours a day that's a part-time job you know yeah. responding to people getting back producing content either you're you're producing the content and you're giving it to somebody else to consume or you're consuming somebody else's content so i think if you're consuming a lot of social media content right now you should hop on the producing side and start giving those that are following you an opportunity even if you have 80 followers or even if you have 80 viewers on your on your stories how do you get those 80 people to know exactly what you do day in and day out for right. them to get back and help you grow your business yeah that makes a lot of sense i i would say i probably spend between two maybe three hours a day on instagram yeah and i watch a maximum i think yeah. three hours a week in front of the tv mm. Yeah. So yeah, I watch like I watch one show a week, which is Sunday night, billions. Yeah. Other than that, you know, I'm <laughs> Instagram, Facebook is just mostly Instagram for me right now. I'm on Instagram literally five, like I said, five and a half hours a day broken up. That's why I'm looking <laughs> at my screen time. So okay, so no money on marketing. What about overhead? Um, our overhead right now, I got two guys on salary and office expenses and all that. Just business expenses alone with from office expenses, maintaining it you know, maintenance and all that, it's running us in salaries are, is running me close to like 9,500 bucks a month. Oh, that's yeah. not terrible. No, not at all. All right, and then, uh, so like the numbers you were doing, like the kind of volume you guys are doing, like what do you bring home revenue wise? So um, we're right now we're producing, like I said, our deals are, are pretty standard. We're, with after paying our guys, paying uh, paying the, the investors, I'm bringing in about 60, 65,000 a month. Wow, so it's we're, not bad. Well, I guess we're close to like, we're hitting that 85 to $100,000 mark every month, but, like some, some deals we, we have to fire sell them and we get immediately out of them. So mm -hmm. not everything's pretty in real estate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got any valuable resources somebody? Like, you know, any anything they sh you, you would recommend? You know, it could be like how to get started even on, on producing content on Instagram. Um, man, pr producing content, is, I don't think it's about producing content, I think it's more about documenting. Yeah. If you're really new to the business, 
like I said, we've become consumers of each other. We consume yeah. each other daily. I consume you, you, you watch my stories. Mm -hmm. So it's more about even if you're new and you don't know what to post, start documenting what you're doing. If you're making cold calls, set the phone on the side and record yourself making a call, crop it to see what you want them to say. Maybe not the whole conversation. And maybe one of your friends might be in the call calling industry. You know, they might work in a call center, might be able to give you tips. And then if you're going out to a property show, like you guys see me posting like the like walking the properties, doing all that stuff. So like share and document, don't really focus on, I gotta create HDTV, I mean HDTV and yeah. uh, Hollywood scenes and all that stuff, just focus on documenting your journey. And then people people love that more than than the guys that take the time to do a, a full HD videos and you know, dr the drones and all that stuff. I don't right. knock it, but like, you're, how, like the time you're gonna spend to make that video, mm -hmm. you could have been documenting the rest of your your hustle, you know, you could have been documenting all the ins and out of what you're doing in the business. So, uh, a lot like the content's right there; it's right in front of you. It you is, know, 100 literally right, right in front, front of you. It's just documenting what you're doing, and, and the more you use it, like I think there's a saying: the more creativity you use, the more you have. So you're not gonna run out of creativity. Yeah. The more creativity you use, the more you're gonna have. And then it's just you stay in front of it, open your eyes, keep your eyes out, and just document, save it. If you're not gonna post it right there and then, save it, and um, you know, start going from there and start sharing experiences. Have a genuine conversation you know like like i said if 80 people are tuning in daily to watch your story mm -hmm. and then give those 80 people something valuable for 800 700 or a thousand or more are tuning in to view your stories don't just sell them don't just tell them what you do like i see so many people posting we buy houses cash we buy houses cash day in and day out and it's like okay bro i know that like you know i know you buy houses cash but all you're doing is marketing instead of branding mm -hmm. instead of like documenting like why don't you show us you bought a house if you really buy houses cash show us the house you bought cash yeah and shows what happened there. And then I think that's when people are like, oh wow, like I had people asking me like, did it, why did it take nine months to sell that property? What happened here? What happened there? Does she really live like that? You know, like they get intrigued in the whole <laughs> journey in the documents and the stories you're posting. So was it you I was laughing at? Like, look at this big dude right here. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, that was, that was kind of messed up. <laughs> I, I do apologize for that one, man. But um, was, we were just messing around with the guys, but, and you know, we asked them for permission to post it, but I, a couple of my followers got upset about that. One. Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Uh, but Me what too. I what I did like also though is that I mean you're showing like creativity yeah. in solving problems because again going back to what we we're talking about earlier on YouTube, you can learn a lot on YouTube, mm -hmm. but until you're actually in it, you, you kind of miss a lot of things. So like I, I like some of the things you post about like uh, empowering homeless people yeah. in a neighborhood yeah. to help you. So again, it goes back to like you got if you're gonna be a part of the community, be a part of it the full, whole way. Yeah. Don't show up snotty, you know. Like mm -hmm. and I tell that people all the time. Trust me, I don't want to be sitting there breaking bear with a homeless, but if that's going to save me thousands of dollars by them avoiding breaking the door, breaking the window, stealing my appliances, I'm going to feed them and I'm right. going to give them a little bit of work, you know? So I do that all the time for them to get familiar because I'm going to go in again into those properties. And a lot of times, like I said, a lot of guys sell so much f fancy stuff to show up too fancy to fancy the properties. All you're doing is setting yourself up. I've seen it happen to a lot of guys. Like they sell, they set themselves up for people are watching, man. Yeah, like so either you don't show up to those properties in a Lambo? Nah, no, nah, <laughs> not me. <laughs> nah, not me. So like I said, um, not the jewelry, none of that fancy stuff, man. Like you can have it, save it for the weekend. Mm -hmm. But when you're hustling, you know, take take advantage of every situation that's out there. Like, if you're dealing with a homeless, like, and instead of just kicking them out of the property, I chop it up with them. Like, hey man, how come you keep breaking in? You don't have nowhere else to sleep. Like, well, I sleep in this other house, and I've had a situation. Like, but that other guy is only there on the weekends, and it's my friend. Like, whoa, how does he live in? You know, because for, for the way I look at it, is like if a homeless guy is hanging out with another guy, and that guy owns his house, that guy might be in a situation. Mm -hmm. So, and I, we've been able to pull wholesale deals like that as well. You know, Damn. we've been able to find this kind of properties <laughs> from homeless guys. Like, yeah, my friend wants to sell his house, or my friend's getting foreclosed on, and it's just like just literally Sally say networking even with with everybody. Man, with that's everybody. nuts. That's <laughs> so, that's a huge golden nugget yeah. right there. Uh, what tools are you using in your business, like CRM? systems no i don't on a, i don't have a crm i have monday.com that i just do like we upload all our leads that are dead on there and the mm. reasons why and, and where did it come from and just to keep track of what source and just to continue seeing where our source and i could go back and just see like it's a graph and it just as long as you input it it pretty much projects as a graph and i can see like okay our sellers leads went up this month or this week and that's pretty much it but we literally have our business more like they're calling in a realtor's calling in, hey i have this deal our guy's taking a lead intake form and then once from there like we barely even use our own purchase contracts man like they're all coming in like i said it's literally a business that what we figured out is making sure we add value to the realtor and to their mm -hmm. sellers and the rest gets done on the back end man so that's, it's just acquiring receiving checks and dispositioning through mls as well that's so. amazing uh Foshi wants to know how, how do you find reliable contractors oh man um uh, I'm yet to find one 
reliable even my in-house guy i struggle to battle i fight with them day in and day out it's a whole other marriage man like <laughs> it's you gotta I, I, I fight him day in and day out like yeah. i'm you know try to get him to get the job done or he's a good guy he gets the job done but the, what i look for is even am i gonna pay forty thousand dollars for a job and you know like is it gonna take three months or can i pay my guy i mean it's gonna take one month or can i pay my guy twelve thousand it's probably gonna take let's say 60 days so mm -hmm. one guy could get it done for double the price or triple the price in a short period of time or these other guys get it done for a quarter or 50 percent of the price and get it done within two months and the way i'll, I'll just analyze it, it's like okay you know i can afford another hard money payment or depending how we restructure the deal um you know we get, we get this one can wait 60 days and then we'll list it but um reliable contractor guys to this day i haven't figured that one out um it's still an uphill battle but overall it's just as long as you know your numbers um you know ask your ask your painters talk to individual workers i wouldn't really deal too much right off the bat with contractors i will find out what what independent painter charge you and then what would what would somebody who installs a uh, towel charge you what would somebody just installs carpet because all the contractor does is coordinate and orchestrate he's all those guys yeah he just manages all that so it's like if you could find out the prices it's just it's just a way for you to negotiate the contractor back it's like hey you know what i know a guy could put a towel so you as long as you know your numbers as uh, like I said, every number every number is different because California's market is completely different than Vegas. I think it's market. like double, double, triple, <laughs> triple. I, I bought a property out there that we we're gonna flip, and I thought it was a fifty thousand dollar rehab. Turns out it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar rehab. Yeah. So luckily, we had enough margins to liquidate <laughs> that one and keep it pushing. But uh, yeah, it's all about knowing your local numbers. But overall, don't go based off the contractors or as well uh, screen as many contracts as you possibly can. Yeah. But try to find out what do they charge. Some of them charge a premium because they manage a the project to the T. They're there daily. And someone won't charge you that much because you're just another guy on the list. So you want to find out: you, am I am I paying you a premium price because you're here daily, or am I just another guy on the list? And that's why you're giving me a, a good deal. Right. So it's just screen screen them, find out what's their business as well. Some of these guys are just workers, you know. They, yeah. they have a license, but they're not businessmen. Uh, some of the uh, I got someone I know in Idaho. What he does is he just goes to the city. Mm. And it's like which contractors do you enjoy working with? Mm. Like you easily approve the permits, whatever they, they turn in. You basically rubber that, stamp it. That's true. That's true. Because uh, you know, one of my in house guys, he's not too liked in the North Las Vegas city. You yeah, know? <laughs> it's like pulling teeth there. We have we've to get a permit approved. Sometimes it takes two to three times because he burned himself in the in the past. Right. But that is true because I've used somebody else that had all his relationships established, at, and it goes back again. It's relationships. Right. If your contractor is, he's going to charge a premium price nine times out of ten. He's going to charge if, a premium price, but you know he, it's going to be done on exactly, time. Exactly. So I, I think it's up. I don't think it's a a good or bad way to doing it. If yeah. you if you have time that you you don't mind waiting two to three months getting it done and and managing yourself, do it. But if you need to pay that premium to get it out and keep it pushing to the next deal, then I recommend you have like you said that tip that you gave. Go to the city and ask what's their favorite contractor. Uh, Fashi wants to know: Is there is there a property type that you'll never touch? Property type, um, luxury for luxury. now. Yeah. yeah, luxury and custom homes. I haven't I haven't figured that one out. I've seen a lot of guys lose big on those. Yeah, and it's always because it's again custom. You know, like the guy who built that customized it for him his own liking. Now you got to find somebody out there that likes that exact custom home. It's, I, that's one thing I don't really step into. I turn them down a lot. It's, yeah. it's either has to be million dollar cookie cutter homes that they're all exactly the same plus, or I'll stay with away from the custom homes. But if anybody can figure it out, it's a heck of an inch. I've tried to figure it out a couple of times, but yeah, I mean for us, we're like if it's not fifty percent, then yeah, it's just right. it's not worth the risk to us. Yeah, no, we buy anything. Yeah, uh, Marcus wants to know how's the new office going. I love it, man. The yeah. office, uh, it's coming together. It was it was a journey to put together, but um, how so? How was it a journey? Uh, um, so again, it's like, for me, I'm always want to be practicing and I don't like anything that easy to hand it to me. So, you know, like, and it's, it's kind of my good and bad thing. Like being against the wall sometimes, sometimes makes me perform to a whole other level. Mm -hmm. So I put myself in situations sometimes that I shouldn't be. And then it's like, example is this office. I got a good deal on it. Like, well, we, we negotiated nine months rent free in exchange. <laughs> Uh, it was a twenty-five thousand dollar rehab that the that the landlord thought he was gonna spend, but we got it done for like ten thousand dollars. So technically, we saved. It was gonna like the nine months that we negotiated in rent would have been twenty grand, but because we spent ten thousand dollars in rehab, we're saving ourselves ten thousand like ten thousand dollars plus nine months rent free. And then I was able to do whatever I wanted with the building. So it was like I created a state of the art studio upstairs, a photography studio. We're still not done with it, but uh, I made that one more for the collaborations as well. So, but any other place with property management and strict laws, the rental laws, I would have never been able to do that. Yeah. So I'm able to build out a, f a photography studio, create whatever I want. 
want and the landlord doesn't care. I just added value to his property. In oh, exchange, yeah. in exchange, I have a one year. If I want to buy it in one year, I could buy it out, and I, I have like a things like twenty five percent equity there. So he has to sell it to me uh, twenty five percent off of what it's worth. Oh, nice. Yeah. What is your why? My why is my kids and my family, man. Like um, as well. Like I think selfishly speaking, myself. Like I don't. I don't want to fail. Like. You know, so it's selfishly speaking, it's myself. I don't want to fail for my kids. You know, I yeah. want to give them. I want to give them. Uh, I want to secure them a future where they don't have to not struggle, but I want to secure them a future that they can step into and I can mentor them their way through, be able to like have a successful business as well. You know. Yeah, that's, so. that's awesome. I, I got the same thing with my kids. Yeah, I give them. I give them entrepreneurship. I think my consequences are more in my mind. Like the consequences I have is more of my why than my actual why. You know, the consequences are deep. I don't want to. I don't want my family going a day without eating or having a roof over the head or losing everything, losing, yeah. or even the guys on my team losing everything and not being able to pay or not being able to have a, uh, like them go home and pay. So it's just like, I think about more of my team as my consequences. So I think my why is more of my consequences. What happens if I don't produce? What happens if I don't line up the right money partners? What happens if we don't resell that property? Like, what are the consequences? Because now as, as a team leader and somebody owns a company, the consequences don't end with me. They end with the company. It's oh, just like now- Massive as, impact. As a seven man team, like even my employees for Trash Art Pros, now it's 10 people that are affected by my decisions. So yeah. I, I try to stay on point at all times. And Yeah, that's good. It's, it's good to remember. Uh, what is your biggest struggle right now? Um, I was listening to 33 Strategies of War and there's this thing, <laughs> I think that he calls it the, the, um, the art of managing men. Managing a team is one of the most difficult things I think I've encountered because it's just it's not as it's not as easy as it looks, you know. So uh, you got different emotions, different uh, sh mindsets, you got different uh, ambitions, and everything is different. So it's just like getting to know each and one of them. Because mm -hmm. for me, it's not about um, throwing five guys on the phone and be like, "Here, pick up the phone and dial." and bring me a freaking deal when you're done and then go home and do your own thing. And then this is how entrepreneurship is done. So it's just like I want I want to see them each grow. And like I've told him, like if your goal is not to make a hundred thousand, it's just make sixty, and you're gonna live comfortable. Well, I want to, I want to help you make sixty grand a year. Mm -hmm. But if your goal, like one of my guys, like he wants to be a millionaire, it's just like, okay, I'm gonna call you out on it. We're gonna sit down, we're gonna have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and you want to make, you want to hit, the, you want to hit that. So it's just like we, I have to adjust a lot of conversations and a lot of emotions. Like dealing with people's emotions is one of my hardest things because I'm kind of, I'm not too emotional around certain yeah. situations. Like I try to be grounded, but so I don't. I don't let emotions make my decisions. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more like directed. So um, it's more about relating down to people on my team and seeing them and managing them and helping them reach their goals. What so, have you done to work on, on management, leadership stuff? Um, right now with my new team, I haven't really done it too much, but with my previous team that I had, it was one-on-one. -on -one. We'll, mm -hmm. um, go to, like, we'll go to the lake together or I'll, I'll go out to lunch individually, buy them lunch. Um, excuse me, one of the things I do a lot is uh, Monday, Monday, Monday morning breakfasts or, or Monday lunches. So I start off the week uh, with the Monday meeting. And then normally out of the eight hours we're in the office, Mondays I think is the least day we hustle. It's like the day we hustle like maybe five or six hours because the morning we're pretty much setting the tone for the rest of the week, encountering objections. I literally almost have a two and a half hour class. And then with them asking them like, what are some objections you're encountering? What are they telling you? What are you guys doing? And then around lunchtime, we always buy lunch and you know, we BS for about an hour. Yeah. So I buy them lunch, we, I bring in lunch, and then I sit there and have, uh, you know, break bread, break bread with them. So, and then same thing, like you get to know somebody more when they're at, at, when they're more relaxed. And I highly recommend the high performance forum. Okay. So uh, guys that have been listening for a while know that I'm all about Darren Hardy. Like that's my mm. idol. Okay. So I spent like two and a half days with him. It's okay. not cheap, but nice. it's worth it. It helped a lot. What is the high performance? Oh, uh, it just, it, it just takes all the, the, um, the methodologies, the systems that Nike, Apple, uh, oh, okay. Tesla, yeah. and how they build out their operations. Mm. So you learn from how they grew their companies. Like, oh, okay, and you can use them for your companies. I'll, t I'll take that. Um, what's your superpower? Oh, man, I don't know, bro. I never thought about that one. I think uh, superpower. I think always finding solutions. Problem right. solver. Problem solver. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Like and my, my mom always criticized me. She's like, you don't take any problem for, you don't ever add the value. You don't ever see the problem you're in because you're always yeah. thinking like, okay, this is what I, I messed up in. Like, what's the solution? And I never like stay that much time in, in the in the problem. So it's like, what's the solution? What's the solution? And just moving forward. That's the single most valuable skill. Yeah. Right. The bigger problems you solve, the more money you make. Uh, sure. Fashi asked, and by the way, Fashi, if I'm saying your name wrong, I really apologize. <laughs> How do you find private money lenders? So uh, again, it, 
originally when I first started wholesaling, it was more, um, I was shopping out the property, met, met a couple guys that wanted to buy the property's cash. And it was like wanting to see how I can add value to them and what would benefit them. So the first, my first experience was they're like, well, you're charging a high commission. It's just like, well, what if I wait for my commission? And they're like, okay, well, wh how would that work? I'm like, just give me half an example. They gave me half, but I was like, I want to go on title just to make sure you're going to pay me. You know, and there was other ways that we could have broke it out, but that was one way. And then after I closed a few transactions with them, I would know what, what they wanted to buy. And so, and then when I came across the mobile homes, because they weren't really buying mobile homes, they were buying more like regular single families. So it was just like when I had it, I knew already how much capital they were working with. So like, hey, why don't you finance me this one? And now instead of like you taking 90% of the profit, why don't I kick you back 20% equity and then I keep 80, but finance me in this particular mobile home. So it was all about leveraging the position you're in right there and then. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're shopping with buyers, like in your buyers only buy a particular area and they actually have capital and they're actually buyers, your buyers are your lenders. You just have to pitch them and mm -hmm. the way you pitch them is just like so whatever you're not buying what about this and you know if i come in at this price or if i come in this because i always think about i always analyze like yeah there's a lot of guys that use hard money but they can only leverage so much but those guys that actually have capital and full actual money it's just like can you build those relationships and f maybe have them finance you a deal or come in and then as you do a couple of deals together like for me it was just like he they, they didn't want to finance my mobile home at 80 20 split they weren't going to take 20 percent. they're like 50 50 like okay let's do this but at the next one's like all right this one the previous one's 50 50 now this one's uh, uh, 60, 40. And then mm -hmm. I worked them down to now and a day. It's just like, you're moving in and out of these within 24 hours. So transaction coordinating, you want to make 2,500 bucks within 24 hours. And now they're just paying transaction coordinating. And then if, in the whole time I'm positioning myself and I'm saving capital. So right. I eliminate them at that point in time. So, and then as you're, as you're acquiring more properties, you should, you should be aware of your surroundings. You're meeting people all the time. And if you're networking, I, I don't like doing business with, I don't like using the same lenders that my, my, uh, my competitors use. Because then there's no leverage, you know. There's no, I have no leverage mm -hmm. over them. So it's just like I, I'm always networking with everybody. Like, I just had a car accident. My chiropractor, he's like, hey, so what, what do you? I, I have a certain amount of money. What? Uh, I just sold a commercial building. I got about nine hundred thousand sitting. Uh, that's a hard money lender. And I'm like, well, I told him I'm a real estate investor. I'm like, well, what are you doing with your money? And I started having a conversation with them. Yeah. Why? Or why are you getting? Well, I don't know, man. I'm just I don't know what to do. So probably less than double digits. Literally. <laughs> So now I sit yeah. down with them and I, I work them down like this. Look, this is some of the scenarios I'm in. If you're interested, let's do it. And yeah. then now I work the scenarios. But at the end of the day, it's getting the experience. Once you have the experience, you have the track record and you documented it, then it's so much easier because you're just speaking from experience. And All somebody right. who's been there and has the experience and, you know, uh, some people say real recognizes real. So some, a chiropractor, a doctor, whoever has money sitting there that you're dealing with. And this is I'm a patient of this chiropractor. I never pitched him. He's just, mm -hmm. what are you doing? You know, you carry yourself a certain way and you act a certain way. It's just like, I'm an investor. I'm right up the street. I'm actually, I'm actually the building two do two doors down from you. Like, oh, yeah. wow. Like, so you guys do buy houses cash. You're like, yep. And then that's when it carries on. Like, well, I want to flip, but I, I don't know. I don't have the time to go out there. Like, you don't need to flip. Have you thought about private money, being a private money guy? Right. And that just carries a conversation. So a lot of, a lot of private money guys are right in front of you as you level up, as you close transactions. Because and they'll find you. And they'll literally find you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see what else is there. Um, What's the greatest lesson you have learned? Greatest lesson I have been learned. <laughs> That's a deep one, bro. Um, if you want it, you gotta go get it, man. Nobody's gonna yeah. give it to you. You know, I, I come from a third world country. I was born in Honduras. So Where? Honduras, Central America. Okay. So I was born in Central America, and uh, you, if you want it, you gotta go get it. Like, just like it took my parents hard work to get here and it was a struggle to get here and then to grow from where they were at to where they're at now it's all like nobody gave it to them like don't wait around for anybody to give it to you so i guess that's one of my biggest things like you, you can't sit around and wait and don't blame anybody else if you don't succeed it's your fault yeah. it's literally your fault so i, I have the whole 100 percent uh, like, like you i, I don't know. pity anybody that says they're struggling that they don't get it it's like it's right there man like every opportunity is right there you just if other people from other countries could do it, so can you, especially if you're from this country. Like, You know what's crazy? This is going to be a terrible rant. Um, mm. So at our networking <laughs> event last week, last Thursday, I was talking with other wholesalers. They're like, man, I got so many people. It's like, man, it's so hard to do at least, like to do this, this, and this. And, I, and we were both I was like, man, you guys have no idea how easy it is yeah. to wholesale now. Yeah. Like we didn't have, you know, I see Annie here, Annie Dragonova. We didn't have batch skip tracing, mm. skip tracing for us. We yeah. didn't have these data companies 
providing data for us. Yeah. We didn't have all these systems, these shows, all this information out yeah. there. So like anyone time someone's like, oh man, it's so hard. It's like, you have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. What hard is. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, and that's the reason I, I respect so many brokers that started before that MLS got where it was at and, yeah. and where they're at because it was it's all goes back to it's who you know and the hands you were shaking and people knowing what you were doing. It, it all goes back to centers communication. You right. know, like the guys who are well spoken know how to communicate, carry a good conversation are the guys that are killing the game. Mm -hmm. Even if you have even if you have, you can have the greatest system, but if you don't know how to communicate that, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, you have to know how to communicate it. So at the end of the day, yeah, it's it's literally like you have no idea. And that's why I like I'm so big on, oh, if he can, like, somebody's, like, I, I hate it when people are like, well, oh, if he can do it, I can too. Like, first of all, you don't know what he's gone through. Mm -hmm. You don't know what that person has gone through. You don't know the late nights, the early mornings, the sacrifice he's made. So, no, if, if he can do it, you can't do it. Like, you don't know the sacrifice he's gone through. And especially, like, half of us don't even share half the sacrifices we've mm -hmm. made to get where we're at. So, like, I never judge somebody like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Because that was my mistake when I first started. I'm watching this guy's Rolls Royce, and I'm like, Mine too. well, if he could do it, I could do it. Like, <laughs> if, if he's a high school dropout and, you know, and, and he doesn't really know how to read, I saw the guy struggling because I'm dyslexic. So it's like, if he struggles to read, then if he could do it, I could do it. But it's just like, no, but the guy's staying late up at night, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. making sure his business is growing while I'm going to bed at 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. So, 9 o'clock at night. So, it's just like, no, it doesn't compare. You know, and it's more about you have you you have no idea where they're at and use what's in front of you to grow from there you know what's crazy and i i, I gotta get off this soapbox but so you know pace morby i think so so he's one of the best closers in town he mm. and i run every monday wednesday friday 5 30 in the morning oh, in sure. gilbert we post on instagram like we yeah, run yeah. we're running yeah i would have paid a lot of money 10 years ago yeah to run with people like us mm. Yeah. No one's asking us, hey, can we join you? Yeah. It's crazy to me. I'm posting on Instagram for a reason. Yeah. Let you guys know this is where I'm at. You guys yeah. want free coaching while running. See, that's one thing I learned in, in the mortgage business, man. There was this coach that was teaching the guy I used to work with. And he's like, you want to grow the best relationships? You don't do it like over coffee. You don't do it over lunch. He said, you do it where you could join. Like, let's say if you're, like you said, you're running. I go out and run with you. Yeah. If you see me keep up for five miles, which I won't right now. <laughs> but if I was keeping up with you in five miles running, you're gonna see that hey, this guy puts in the work. He's out here five a.m. Yeah. So then you, our our bond is only gonna, gonna grow much more from there. One hundred percent. You know, so like I, that's one thing I learned from the very beginning. Is like you want to see somebody grow, is, is go and and that's why sometimes like have a meeting early in the morning. Be like, oh, my day's tied up. Whoa, what are you doing six a.m.? Like, what do you mean? Like I'm right. up at five, but and I and I push it there. And like or same thing. I've had meetings at ten, twelve o'clock at night. I've dealt with sellers at eleven o'clock at night. I've had realtors show me properties late at night, mm -hmm. and it's just like and it's because they their work. Like I've closed a deal at three o'clock in the morning. You know, like literally locked up a deal at three o'clock in the morning because the guy was so busy during the day. His only time he had to respond was three a.m. I responded at three three o five. He's like, oh shit, you're up. I was like, yeah, I am. And then we just locked up the deal right there and then. So Absolutely. it's just like people see the sacrifices and they and they appreciate it. It's the underdog story. Everybody can relate to an underdog. So if you're out hustling you're, and you're out in the trenches with them, you know, we talk about that a lot. If you're in the trenches, people appreciate that, man. Yep. All right, guys. So to, tomorrow actually marks our one-year anniversary. I can't oh, believe congratulations, it's been bro. one year. Thank you. Congratulations. So you're it's done. been one year tomorrow. So, guys, follow me on Instagram, steve.trang, for details. I'm going to share with you guys how you guys can get a free Real Estate Disruptors t-shirt. They're tight. I like so, that. Thank you. So guys, follow me on Instagram, steve.trang, and I'm gonna be posting details on how to get a free shirt. Uh, and then uh, our workshop's filling up. So if you guys are interested, it's May 25th, it's in Phoenix. If you guys wanna know exactly how my business runs, my, uh, my partner Max and me, how we're able to t uh, lock up deals in the competitive Phoenix area, text 345-345 with the word disruptor workshop. And Jamil's gonna be here next week. Um, they run Keegley and he's going to talk about his journey, how they went from Phoenix to Florida. I think they're Atlanta, Vegas. I'm sure oh. you're excited about that. Yeah. And uh, uh, Salt Lake, but they're in multiple cities. So he's going to talk about how Keegley went from just Phoenix to uh, multiple cities throughout the country. Um, and that's it. If someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they get hold of you? Instagram, uh, property plug, well, property underscore plug. And be patient, please. <laughs> I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting blown up like crazy daily, so be patient. We're working on getting it back to everybody's DMs. So yeah, yeah. But that's cool, man. Like I I, I had so many people that I would reach out to back in the day. Yeah. And they would not get back to me. Yeah. And it was irritating. So I am doing my absolute best to get back to as many people. And you're yeah. doing the same. Trying, bro, as much as possible. Yeah. You know, we get back. My my office manager and I sometimes have like Instagram messaging day where. He'll hop on my DMs <laughs> and we'll go, both of us go for like two hours straight just answering messages. So yeah. I'm thankful, man. I, I actually thank everybody who's shown me support and, and, the, and so much love, man. Like, I really appreciate that. I didn't, 
you know, I haven't done nothing magical. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and people are loving it and showing me massive support. So I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, awesome. All right. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you. Thank you. This Appreciate is good. it, bro. Thank you.